That's a tongue twister. Mm. Hi, we're here at the Art Gallery of Ontario for the Picasso exhibit. Joining me is Elizabeth Smith. Hi, Elizabeth, how are you? Hi, I'm fine, how are you? Doing very well. Thank you for having us here at the exhibit. Elizabeth, can you tell me what do you do for the Art Gallery? Uh, my job is Executive Director of Curatorial Affairs, which means I have oversight of the curatorial departments at the gallery, and I also was fortunate enough to be the curator in charge for the Picasso exhibition as it's presented at AGO. So this is quite a coup to have the Picasso exhibit here. How did that come to be at the Art Gallery? Well, we were very lucky because we were able to negotiate an agreement with the Musée Picasso in Paris that is sending its collection on the road while they renovate their building in Paris. Convenient. So from their vast collection of about 5,000 works, they selected a really strong and important group of about 100, almost 150 pieces by Picasso from the beginning of his career to the end of his career. And we were able to become part of an international tour um, the show has been all around the world, but we are really excited and fortunate to be the only venue in Canada to present the exhibition. So let's check the exhibition out. Obviously, that's what people want to see. So we have, um, you've mentioned that the um, display is organized chronologically, correct? Yes, yes, it is organized chronologically into nine rooms. And each room contains a quite ample presentation of works that Picasso made at different moments of his career. And it's so fascinating for us to trace where he began when he was a young artist. He was apparently incredibly versatile and he was able to draw like an old master and as he once commented he had to spend his whole life learning how to draw like a child because he wanted to get that kind of exuberance and energy and vitality into his work that is a hallmark of modern art. So this example that we're seeing right here, what style, because I think Picasso is generally known for like cubism, would this be a good example of that? Well, this piece is definitely influenced by cubism. He actually developed that style along with a colleague, another painter named George Brock in the, um, around 1909, 10, 11, 12. And this piece is a bit later. This piece is in the late 1920s. But you can see that it's very cubistic in that it presents a scene, a reality of two figures who are presented in a, a very sort of dynamic uh, and movemented way. So um, the cubist impulse has really informed his presentation of this work. It's not a realistic depiction, but it gives a sense of the vitality and energy uh, and the movement in space of two figures intertwined into a passionate embrace. And the title of the piece is The Kiss. And it's been positioned beside another piece that is much more of a realistic portrayal of that painting, correct? That's right, which is a, it's a fascinating way to understand how inventive and innovative Picasso was and how, um, how versatile he was, because he could work in so many different styles and different ways, which is something that this exhibition really emphasizes. Uh, this piece, which is called The Village Dance, was made uh, just a couple of years earlier than the, the Kiss piece, and it's it's so much more traditional and realistic in appearance. It was inspired by some travels that he made in Italy uh, and in Greece um, around 1917-18. You know, and he was very inspired by classical sculpture. And so you see that these sort of heavy forms of the man and woman in the, um, the painting are influenced by classical sculpture. And it's really nice to have these two side by side because you can almost see similarities right. between the two. It makes this one right. easier to see the faces and in the embrace. Exactly, exactly. That. And both are, you know, both show us a couple, um, but, you know, a man and a woman, but yet in such different styles and vocabularies. And now you mentioned that he was influenced by sculpture, and Picasso is not just known for his painting, but also his sculpture. So you have a good collection of that as well, yes. do you not? Yes, we have a great group of three-dimensional works in the show, along with paintings and works on paper. So it gives a really good sense of the, the different media um, in which Picasso worked. Um, this piece is a great example of a Cubist-inspired sculpture. And um, it's a guitar, you know. It, it, I, I can it, see uh, that. Right, <laughs> right. I mean, it's actually titled guitar. Okay. And, it, you know, I think it's easy enough for us to make out that it is a guitar, but it is not a realistic guitar. It's not a traditionally represented guitar. Yeah. Um, but yet the way Picasso is able to manipulate the forms uh, and the relationships within the piece, you know, it, it, it's evident um, what it is. And I think that was part of his mastery. Um, and also 
also his interest because he always stuck with recognizable objects or the human form in his work. He never went completely abstract like so many of the modern artists did. So that is another reason why I think people feel that Picasso is, you know, certainly he's the most famous, but also he's the most influential artist of the 20th century, and his work has a lot of accessibility to it today. I mean, I think everybody can sort of enjoy and get something from, um, from Picasso's work. So why do you think he's been so influential? Do you think it's because of that recognizability in his shapes? And um, I, th I think that was part of it, but I also think that you know, he was both an inventor and somebody who responded to other um, art historical movements and traditions. And he was, he was influenced by so many different things, by African art, mm -hmm. by classical sculpture, um, by the surrealist movement, and by the old masters. And toward the end of his life, he made a lot of paintings that were um, sort of direct homages to old masters like Velazquez and Goya and Rembrandt and others. So, so uh, his work sort of spans like the whole spectrum of our art history in a way, but reinterprets it. And so many younger artists today actually continue to look at Picasso as this amazing innovator and somebody who could work in so many different ways, you know, who's not just um, categorized in, in one particular um, way of working. And I think that appeals to today's artists' sensibilities and to all of us today who are, you know, interested in so many different aspects of, of, of what the world has to offer. So which of Picasso's most well-known pieces are here on display at the AGO? Well, we have a number of uh, well-known pieces by Picasso, and I would say that um, uh, some of his cubist paintings and pieces are, you know, quite important. There's also an early work in the show made in um, 1904 called La Celestina, which is a prime example from his blue period, and that was Picasso's first period as an artist where um, he was really sort of developing his own style, but uh, creating everything with a blue background to um, present a kind of um, melancholy mood and to, um, to pay homage to earlier artists who were using unconventional colors and unconventional forms to, to give their art a new direction and vitality. So I know he went through the blue period and after that, or oh, maybe not chronologically after, but later a rose period. Right. Do you think that he was um, going like, blue is kind of sad and rose we see as happier? Was that those kind of reflecting what he was going through in his personal life at the yeah, time? Yes, exactly, exactly. I mean, I think with every artist, you, you have an interweaving of, of, you know, the personal and the sort of purely aesthetic and, and um, in some cases, responses to events in the world, you know, around you. Now, Elizabeth, how long will the display be here at the AGO? It will be on view through August 26th. Thank you so much. And now we rejoin the studio.